This morning, we're going to continue with our study of, through the book of James. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and be turning to James chapter 4. That's where we're going to be spending the majority of our time. This morning, James talks an awful lot in his book about loving your neighbor. And as I got to thinking about my neighbor, and who is my neighbor? Who are my neighbors? Who have my neighbors been? Well, that's an awful lot of people. And if I look back to my childhood, this is a satellite image of my neck of the woods, if you will. Okay, circle right there, that's the street that I grew up on. And that arrow right there is pointing to my house as a kid. I lived there till I was a sophomore in high school. And the kids on my street, my brother's best friend, Michael, lived right next door to us. Uh, Greg lived down the street from us. A girlfriend that I had was named Paige, lived right there. We had a, um, um, a family, named, they were uh, Pakistani, lived in that house. Suleiman was, his, was the son. He and I were really good friends. And then Philip lived right there. We played a lot of basketball, jumped on the trampoline together, built forts together. And that was, that was my street. But if we zoom out just a little bit more, Scott lived in this house right here. He was a really, really good friend of mine. John lived in that house. Way over there, kind of in the middle, was Lee. And he was another good friend of mine. But my best friend in all the world, JT, lived right there. We were thick as thieves. If we were doing something, we were together, either all of us or a portion of us, we were all together. There was a little convenience store right up there we used to frequent, uh, buy our snacks and, and junk food at Wade Walker Park. That's where our public pool was in the summer. You could always find a bunch of us kids there. And way over there to the left, that was my elementary school, Rock Ridge Elementary School. That's where we lived. And if you were in this area, me and my bicycle, you were free game. That's where, that was my world. And so I look at... This and I think, you know, that's a lot of different places. Uh, I've lived in roughly in 10 different places since I was, since I was born. Whether it be in a, growing up in Atlanta or whether I was in college or whether here in Paducah. 10 different places, that's a lot of neighbors. And as we study through the book of James here in chapter 4, James is kind of bringing his letter to a close and he's challenging God's people to focus on how they treat one another. And the theme of his book thus far has been loving your neighbor. James sets forth three different ways we are to love our neighbor. First and foremost, we are to love our neighbors through our speech. I love my neighbor through my speech. He starts out and he says, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. What is it to slander? Slander is saying something false or damaging about someone. Now, whether you make something up, whether you misrepresent someone, or whether you only focus on the negatives, that's still slander. When I go to someone who uh, I'm meeting for the first time, oh, hey, Jason, I've heard a lot about you. Well, don't only, rem only, uh, only consider the good parts. I know that doesn't leave much, you know, because that's just in, in today's day and age, oftentimes we like to say, oh, I know him. Yeah, he's a good guy, but man, can you believe he does this? And he's done this. He, and they, they do this over here. You know, only focusing on the negative parts, making up stuff, misrepresenting someone. Those are all ways that we slander one another. Where does slander come from? Slander basically comes from a jealousy that we may have. Malice, doing things from malicious intent. And I think about the word malice. Uh, I think about uh, one of my favorite movies, Remember the Titans, and if you've seen Remember the Titans, you'll know that uh, the coach is in Virginia. He's coaching a high school basketball team, uh, T.C. Williams High School in Virginia, and set in 1971. And Coach, coach Herman Boone is the, is the coach, and he's, he's on, on track to win a state championship. At the beginning of his season, uh, he goes to a, a summer camp with his kids, and back in then in Virginia, there were a lot of race, race, race issues that were going on, and the football team was no different. It was, a, it was an integrated school. And so one morning, he gets them up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and he goes for a, an early morning run. And they, they're, you know, they're in their boxer shorts, their T-shirts, and they literally are, are running over the river and through the woods 
to get to their destination. So they're running, they're running, they're running, and just about the time the sun is starting to, to bring light into where they are, they pause at a cemetery. And the cemetery is covered with fog. You can barely make out the headstones. And he looks at his team and he says, anybody know what this place is? He said, this is Gettysburg. This is where they fought the Battle of Gettysburg. 50,000 men died right here on this field fighting the same fight we're still fighting amongst ourselves today. This green field right here was painted red, bubbling with the blood of young boys, smoke and hot lead pouring right through their bodies. Listen to their souls, men. And then he pauses and he, and he quotes what possibly a survivor may have said. He said, I killed my brother with malice in my heart. Hatred destroyed my family. Hatred, slander, malice. If we're doing those things, we're cer certainly not speaking love into our brothers and our sisters. We're not treating our brothers with love through our speech. Daniel chapter six, as King Belshazzar has just recently passed away, Darius the Mede is appointed king. And Darius goes and he's, he's putting together his government and he puts together three officials and 120 kind of government officials and the three administrators, one of those is Daniel. And Daniel, of course, is a man of God and his spirit, he's full of God's spirit and he, he's, he's so well liked by the king that the king is gonna put him in charge of his entire kingdom. And the other officials, they start getting jealous and they think to themselves, how can we bring something against Daniel? How can we knock him down a little bit and take some of his power? But they're unable to do so because he was, had an extraordinary spirit. Uh, the, uh, the other guys, they were jealous of. And the Bible says that they tried to bring a charge against Daniel, but they were unable to do so because he was trustworthy and no corruption or neglect was found in him. So they said, well, we can't say anything about him personally, so let's make something up. Let's talk about his God. And they did. And of course, jealousy and malice and slander put Daniel in the den of lions because they were jealous of him. But our job is not to do that. It is to speak of good and not bad. Romans 12, 19 through 21 says, never take your own revenge, beloved. Leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If you're, he is thirsty, give him a drink. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Our job is to love our neighbor through the way we speak. We are to kill them, if you will, with kindness. He continues in verse 11. He says, anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges the law. Well, what law is he talking about? Well, if you stay in the context of James, you'll look at James chapter two, verse eight, and he's talking about the loyal law, the royal law. He says, which is to love your enemy, love your neighbor as yourself. Rather than showing favoritism or jealousy, you are to love your neighbor as yourself. In four, chapter four, he says that the members of the church there, both rich and poor, they were fighting with one another. They were all concerned about what they wanted, what they couldn't have. And Dave Ramsey refers to this as stuff-itis, thinking that if I accumulate enough stuff, accumulate enough wealth, then I'll be happy and I'll be content. But he says that's just not the case. They were asking and they were fighting with the wrong motives. We need to avoid fighting and jealousy by asking God with the right motives. Matthew 6, 33 says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. Everything that we need will be given to us if we just ask God. Romans 8, 28 says that we know in all things that God works to the good of those who love him and who've been called according to his purpose. Now, I can pray for a Lamborghini all day long, but I'm not gonna get it. But if I pray that God opens a door of opportunity for me to talk to a friend about him or the, the salvation that I have through his son, well, sure, he's gonna answer those prayers all day long. Paul writes in Philippians 4 that we need to be content regardless of our situation, regardless of our circumstances, whether rich or poor, well-fed or hungry, whether free or in prison. He says, I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength. Not that I can climb Mount Everest because God gives me strength, but that I can be content, I can find joy, I can be happy regardless of my circumstance as long as I have 
Christ Jesus. We are to avoid our fighting with our neighbors. We are to love our neighbors through our speech. Number two, we are to love our neighbors through our actions, through our actions. He continues in verse 11, he says, when you judge the law, you are not keeping it or being a doer of the law, but sitting in judgment on the law. You judge the law the same way you judge your neighbor, by showing favoritism and discriminating against it. In order to love your neighbor, you must submit to God. 1 John 3, 18 says, submit yourself then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You cannot resist the devil if you don't draw near to God. You can't love your neighbor if you're slandering him or showing favoritism towards him. And now you might be thinking to yourself, well, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Well, I'm glad you asked because a teacher of the law, an expert in law, asked Jesus the very same thing. In Luke chapter 10, an expert of the law stood up to test him and he said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He wasn't looking for the type of person he needs to be. He was looking for a checklist. What one thing must I do? He says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? The man answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus said, do this and you will live. But wanting to justify him, Himself, he asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? So then Jesus proceeds to tell him a story. It says that a man is going from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and on this road, he's attacked by robbers, and he's beat up, and he's left for dead. All of his stuff's taken from him. And three different people come by and, and see him. The first is a priest. Now, a priest is the highest, if you will, the highest level of society, okay? And he's walking down, and he looks at this guy, and he says, ah, I don't know. This guy might be dead, and if I touch him, then I'm going to be unclean, and I won't be able to do my job. So he crosses the street, and he walks around and keeps on his way. Highest level of society. Second guy comes along. It's a Levite. Now, Levite was an expert in the law, very similar to the person who's asking Jesus this very question. So he looks at him. He says, I don't know. This guy might be dead. If I touch him, I'm going to be unclean. I won't be able to do my job. So he, too, crosses the road. He goes around him and on his way. The third guy that comes along is a Samaritan. Now, you think Samaritan, he's the lowest rung of the societal ladder. He is, nobody likes Samaritan. Nobody wants to be a Samaritan. A Jew, according to the woman at the well, wasn't even supposed to associate with a Samaritan. But the Samaritan goes to the man. He bandages his wounds. He, he takes him to an inn. He pays for all of, his, all of his doctor bills and said, if there's anything left over, when I come back, I'll pay it. Okay? So Jesus says, which was the neighbor to the man? And the expert in law says, well, I suppose it was the one who had mercy on him. He couldn't even say the word Samaritan. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. Go and do what? Go, go tend to people that are beat up? No. Go and love your neighbor. Who is the neighbor? The Samaritan. Go and love a Samaritan. Go and love the Samaritans. That's our job is to love our neighbor, love our Samaritans. Go and do likewise. Matthew 5, 43 and following says, love your neighbor and pray for those who persecute you. If you love only those who love you, what reward do you get? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what good is that? Even the unrighteous, even the Gentiles do that. Big whoop, whoop doo You know, if that's what we're only doing, then really, really, what good is that? So I got to thinking about, there's basically, there's three types of neighbors, okay? There's, there's neighbors that are, that are easy to love, okay? Lo neighbors, people that are easy to love. My wife, easy to love. My children, easy to love. Not always easy to like, but always easy to love. They would say the same to me. That's okay, okay? Dan, Dan, for me, easy to, easy to love. Worked for him for, worked with him for 20 plus years. Love him, okay? Craig, a lot of things in common with Craig. Easy to love, okay? Dustin, easy to love. He and I have got a lot of similarities, okay? He's got these dumb old sideburns. You know, I, I really, I got your back, Dan. You those, I keep telling him, you need to shave those dumb old sideburns. You know, I just, we're not in California anymore. Get you a razor that works above the bottom of your ear, you know, and shaves up a little bit. But I love Dustin. Okay, easy, easy to love. You got people that are difficult to love, you know. Well, people with a different political 
view as you. You know, Republicans, Democrats, oh, I don't know. They, they vote differently. They see the world differently than I do. They're difficult to love, okay? Maybe. What about, what about people of a different race than you? Ah, oh, white people, they're weird. Well, white people are weird. I'm not weird, but white people in general are weird, okay? Black people, they're weird. Oh, you know? Okay, how about people that are a different age than you? Oh, teenagers, I don't like teenagers. You know, play their music really loud, they run around, wear holes in their jeans, shorts and flip-flops. Come on, they're lazy, all they wanna do is play video games. I just don't get it, okay? Might be difficult to love people of a different age. Geography might play a role. I grew up in, in Georgia, okay? So it's, it's hard for me to love Yankees. I'm just gonna be honest with you. It is, sometimes it is. It's tough, right? Amen. Okay, I'm getting some amens, okay? All right, what about people of different um, economic status? Rich, poor, haves, have-nots, live on this side of the track, that side of the track, okay? Sometimes they can be difficult to love. And then you get into people, your neighbors that are just downright hard to love, very, very hard to love. I'll be honest with you guys. It's hard for me to love terrorists. People that blatantly want to kill me, I have a really hard time loving those people, okay? I do have a hard time with it, okay? What about people who struggle maybe with gender identity, okay? It's hard to love. Mm, is, that a, is, that a, is that a guy or is that a girl? Uh, I don't know. I'm gonna go over here so I don't have to associate with them, okay? it will be awkward, okay? What about people who struggle with uh, sexual orientation? Hmm? Oh, I don't, I don't know. I want to shake his hand. I might get something. I want to shake her hand. I might get something. Really? Really? Is that where we're at? For God so loved the entire world that he gave his son to die for the entire world. What right do I have to discriminate against someone that God himself loved, that God sacrificed his own son on a cross for. I don't have the right to do that. Even though it's difficult, sometimes it's downright hard to do, we still have an obligation to love them. Now, we don't have to condone their lifestyle, but we do have an obligation to love them. Judge the law the, is opposite of doing what it says. James 1 says, do not merely listen to the word, but do what it says. By doing what it says, you will be blessed. Keeping the law is loving your neighbor. He continues in verse 12 and he says, there is only one lawgiver and judge, that's God, and one who is able to save and destroy through Jesus Christ. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ, Romans 8, 1 and 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. So how do we become that? Well, Romans 6 says that we're baptized into Christ Jesus. Since we are baptized, there is no condemnation. We love our neighbors through our actions. He continues in verse 12, he says, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? If you really keep the royal law, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. Loving your neighbor is the opposite of judging your neighbor. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18 says this, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. That's where it comes from. He continues, verse 13, 14, 15, he says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow I will go into this city, spend a year there, engage in business, and make money, why you don't even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist, a vapor, here today, and then you vanish. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will go and do this or that. They thought, the people in James, that they could go anywhere they wanted to, they could do anything they wanted to to anybody, and they didn't matter. They could treat people however they wanted to. But God was telling him that is not the way it should be. Dear children, let us love with words and speech, but also in action and in truth. 1 John 3 18. We are to love our neighbors through our actions. And number three, we are to love our neighbor in the way that we think, in the way that we think. The root of all of our speech and all of our action starts in our mind, how we think. Verse 17, if anyone then who knows the good he ought to do but doesn't do it, sins. Now you think to yourself, well, what exactly does that mean? Well, our speech and our actions start in our mind. We need to think 
about the way we can love our neighbors. We need to not slander our neighbors, not show favoritism, not discriminate. We need to love the Samaritan. It doesn't take money to do this. You don't have to be in the right financial bracket or the right age bracket. You could change a tire for somebody. I always keep a pair of jumper cables in my car in case somebody needs to be, gets their car, dead car jumped off. Okay, we can hold the door for people, pick up trash. There's all thing, kinds of things that we can do. Uh, Leslie and I were in Atlanta back several years ago and uh, she was shopping with her mom. So I was kind of running some errands myself and I was going around 285, the big perimeter, 12 lanes of traffic. And there's a, a van that's pulled over to the side, obviously has a flat tire. So I pull over, I get out to this lady and her, and her daughter and they're on their way to the airport. And she is on her way to get, get on a plane to go take a college uh, a, um, entrance interview. And she was gonna miss her, miss her plane. So I got out, changed the tire, pretty good change of tires. Uh, so it didn't, it didn't take me long to do it. And they were like, oh, they were lost. They, didn't know, they were on their phone their, with their husband. Hey, what do I do? And then, you know, so we got them on their way. Didn't take any, very little time at all. No money at all. Okay, but there are obviously there are different ways that we can love our neighbor, but we have to have the right mindset. Are we focused on ourselves or are we focused on others? Are we thinking about how we can love our neighbor or how we can better ourselves and better our own lives? Matthew 20, 28 says, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you'll be able to be tested and approved what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God's will for us is that we love our neighbor through our speech, our action, and in our thoughts. If you are here today and you need the prayers of the church, if you're here today and you need to put Jesus Christ on in baptism, we invite you to do so as together we stand and as we sing.